Hi, this is Anthony with MakeWordMusic.com, and we have a special guest with us from New York City. His name's Patrick Grant, and he's a composer. Thank you for joining us, Patrick. Ah, hey, Anthony. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it's a real privilege to have you on here, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time this early morning to, uh, to chat. We'll see how you feel about that a little later. <laughs> so can you give us a... I know you've been working in music for 30 years now, um, and you've got a lot going on now, a lot of momentum in your career. Can you uh, talk about some of the projects you've got going on right now and some of the highlights uh, that you care to share with us? Um, sure. I've, uh, I was born in Detroit. I was making music there. Um, not No child prodigy by any means. I was, I was always interested in visual art, but I made this shift to music when I was around 11 years old because it just seemed to be a way of, um, cre another way of creating universes within which to dwell, mm -hmm. which is probably um, a good way for um, a firstborn child to go when you have no other playmates just to create these universes. But anyways, um, I'll be jumping ahead many years here. Um, I moved to New York in 1985 to um, continue schooling at the Juilliard School to finish there, as well as to play in bands, because I was also interested in, in um, rock and pop music, which is you know a real uh, Detroit thing to have a, a foot in both worlds. And I've continued to have a, a foot in both worlds ever since. If I had three feet, I'd probably be sticking that into a third world, too. But it seems that every, every five years or so, um, I take my work into a different direction, but it's all part of the same thing. One of the things that really got me going here in New York City was the opportunity to work with theater companies that always need composers, avant-garde theater companies were you know, creating original work, as well as having an opportunity to um, put on concerts and perform in the art galleries, because that always attracted me you know, as an idea. And still, um, I produce a lot of shows myself, so I always had that little rascals, hey guys, let's put on a show kind of a feel. But I liked the fact that a lot of the composers I admired, uh, John Cage and Philip Glass, you know, at the time in the 80s, that um, they drew a lot of um, inspiration and, and resource from the art world here in New York City. So that was uh, um, a way for me to go. And so along the way, I found myself creating music for theater and dance, working with Gamelon, um, writing a lot of um, electronic music. Um, I'm probably, I, for a while, I was known mostly as being a keyboardist, but when I decided to try out the guitar circles of Robert Fripp and get back into my guitar playing, I created um, this project, Tilted Axes, Music for Mobile Electric Guitars, that has most people now uh, thinking of me as a guitarist or working with electronic, uh, with electric guitars more than anything else. And generally, I feel that when people feel a little too comfortable in terms of what I am, it's uh, time to shake things up. So maybe that's uh, what lies ahead for me in uh, 2017, time to shake things up again. That's great. Uh, that was my, That's how you and I met. We were at the Guitar Craft uh, course in Mexico. Uh, you were in the uh, guitar, the GC prep, and... Uh, Oh, the OCG prep, the Orchestra of Crafty Guitarist preparation course, and I was in the intro course. But uh, yeah, so I that's how I found out about you just playing guitar. So, um, but obviously you're you're you've done much more than guitar. I absolutely love on the Tilted Axis CD how much you blend a lot of the very guitar circle oriented material, or just some of the kind of thematic or concepts from that style of music into a kind of a rock oriented context or certainly groove oriented so I really appreciate that about your album yeah well I, I would say that um, one of the things that uh, drew me to the guitar circle was I was working with um, large I had just started re-examining large guitar ensembles a um, year or two prior to uh, joining the guitar circle or even really knowing about the guitar circle and actually created the Tilted Axis project and what uh, drew me so much to the group was its similarity to my work with the Indonesian gamelan and creating music in circles and how working within a circle 
inspires music that's created by um, geometrical and visual patterns, mm -hmm. which I've done, which I've done a lot of before. So um, yeah, I definitely have um, absorbed some of the techniques from the circle, but I, I also say at the same time, I've also admired how the circle has absorbed other techniques from um, the gamelan itself. Absolutely. Which doesn't seem surprising because when I look at a lot of their work, their work, um, or I'm happy to say our work in the circle over those uh, number of years, th there, there's just a lot of parallels there in terms of how music can be made, in terms of circulations, in terms of um, breaking up music made in a circle into different patterns of twos, threes, fours, fives, sixes, even nines, and having it all work out uh, equally well, you know, in terms of 360-degree uh, music. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, I definitely have um, incorporated uh, or synthesized um, a lot of stuff. That's um, probably something I got from working with uh, the Living Theater. The Living Theater is... Uh, if you don't, one doesn't know what the Living Theater is, they should uh, definitely look it up. Because one of the things that attracted me to working with them is um, they um, had a long history, but they were also the the venue um, upon which composers like John Cage and Lou Harrison, another gamelan guy, you know, um, were able to produce their first concerts in the 1950s and 1960s, and they would always give a lot of uh, trust to their composers just to really create and being a uh, composer for them also meant that I had a space to work within. So there was a you know, there was a parallel there in terms of um, in terms of um, oh yeah in terms of you know working with um, and synthesizing a lot of different elements in fact the Living Theater is probably most known for and have been credited with being synthesists in that whatever's going on you know, in their environment, with not as just individuals, but in the zeitgeist, finding a way of um, pulling everything together under a larger umbrella and um, and showing the bigger picture. So yeah, the Tilted Axis project was definitely part of that. There's a lot of uh, kinds of music I was working with that appeared on that album, as well as a lot of guitar stuff that, as you said, yeah, it did end up becoming sort of groovified in terms of the the greater good, or at least making what I hope turned out to be a, a cohesive album. I, I think it's a fantastic record. Um, and the the needle variations and the, the coda, um, I laughed for minutes, uh, not because there was anything comical, but just because I love what you, what you did. It brought such joy. Uh, to my heart, uh, hearing those pieces reinterpreted in that style, I thought it was great. Yeah, those were um, two themes. Um, one's a very the famous, very famous guitar craft theme, "I Have the Needle" by Robert Fripp, and then this other one um, was just a riff, um, a, a way of breaking up rhythm that had a lot of um, resonance with what Bartok does in terms of what he gets from um, folk music that I just put a blues scale into, and mm -hmm. then I Have the Needle, I was playing that, um, at least its core riff, being the same fingering, but played in standard a standard tuned guitar, as opposed mm -hmm. to um, a new standard tuning guitar, which, which yielded a fan in, in one position, it's all whole tones, in another position, it's all pentatonic, and then writing melodies that pulled it all together. But Robert was very generous in saying, Go for it because uh, I think he knew that um, it wasn't a goof, but it was it was very least really, you know a sincere experiment. So right, it's was, great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I was definitely happy to have his support of that with a bit of a a wink and a nudge. But he, I think he's glad how it turned out as well. That's cool. Can you tell us about um, some of your other musical releases um, that might be available for purchase or listening, um, you know, online or outside of a theater. Sure. Well, I've put the... Uh, I, I had been self-releasing, um, and they're available um, th oh, th three, th uh, four other albums. <coughs> One is... Um, um, shows a period of time about... Jeez. Uh, in the late 90s, when I was doing a lot of work, that was combining my love of Gamelon 
with chamber ensembles, so I was playing a lot of keyboards that might have been um, tuned according to the gamelan, or I'd be using pure just intonation tunings, mixed in with violas and and guitars, and and uh, I think there's one piece on there, a lot of music for film, I'd have been doing music for um, a horror film that had, uh, for a while, was my, um, the, uh, the essence of what was called the Patrick Grant Group, which was 13 musicians of, uh, it was like, that in itself was a mini orchestra, using three keyboardists as its foundation. That I got from uh, PDQ Bach when I was a kid. He wrote this opera, um, Hansel and Gretel, Ted and Alice, an opera in one unnatural act. <laughs> that uh, I was impressed because they had a piano, they had a harpsichord, and they had a calliope. And the sound of those three keyboards were uh, was a perfect MIDI orchestra. So I've always used three keyboards in my ensemble, augmented with um, violin, cello, trombone, electric guitar, flute and clarinet, and uh, two percussion. So, yeah, so a lot of work from that time period. You'll find that out there. And then... Um, the work for Gamelon proper, um, some of the scores that I've written for uh, theatrical visionary Robert Wilson, uh, most famous to most for his uh, creation Einstein on the Beach with Philip Glass. And for me, that was a huge influence in terms of what could be done on the stage and in terms of how music could be used um, in the creation of a non-narrative narrative, which was a fantastic and I asked you know Bob Wilson would say to me like Patrick everybody always asks me what is Einstein on the beach about and I just tell them themes and variations <laughs> themes and variations and as a musician that's all I needed to hear I thought that's the story you know and that's uh, how we can create a lot of narratives uh, themes and variations so uh, yeah so it, it's I decided to try something different this year, and um, I put together the Tilted Axis Mobile for Electric Guitars album, and that did, um, I'd say, better than I expected. And, uh, mm. and I was happy that um, the public and the press really responded to it, and there's all kinds of music blogs out there I never knew existed who, uh, yeah. who wrote some nice things about it, but also... Um, larger organizations like the the Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal, Prague in the UK, the Huffington Post, they really were able to see what I was doing, I felt, you know, in terms of it's not a rock album, it's not a classical album, really trying to, um, if you look beyond, you know, the veneer of like, hey, electric guitars, there's actually compositional elements going on there that I'm happy that people um, were, listening, were, were listening to. So now the trick is how to follow that up. Um, the good news is there is a plan. <laughs> and that plan is, is that I have um, a number of tracks that I'm finishing now and a number of tracks that have just been sitting around for the last year waiting for a reason that, um, that showcase uh, the other kinds of music that, I've, that, I, that I do that I'm working on. I mean, I would say compositionally, it's going, oh, it's, whether you like it or not, you say, oh, it sounds like me, or sounds like, uh, you know, what I was uh, influenced by that week or working with that week. But uh, um, I'd say it's mostly, uh, for lack of a better word, chamber music. You know, a lot of music for um, ensembles I've written for, there'll be some electric guitar, there'll be percussion and bass, but also, you know, violins and cellos and wind instruments and um, I think, and some singing. Yes, there's, there's a, I guess one of the hits is this one uh, piece that uses a very, very old public domain recording of, um, of one of those Smithsonian Folkways recordings that were made down in Louisiana that I've um, added elements to. So I figured that while I have people's ear, let's put out some other stuff to balance that out. Because um, on its heels, um, then the, the album after that is the, um, is the next uh, uh, Tilted Axis music, which was going to be a little bit more um, thorny and convoluted than the first album. 
first album dealt with themes and variations of different kinds of um, genres that one would associate with electric guitar. You know, you have the punk ones, the blues ones, space ones, even some that uh, bordering on jazz to some uh, level or another. But I would say that I'm trying to showcase what I can do in a contemporary classical way with the next album, then the Tilted album that we're already working on coming out after that. It's going to be sort of a mix of the two in that the compositional forms might be a little bit, I wouldn't say longer, but I'd say broader mm. in terms of, um, or more convoluted, because one of the things that, um, one of the reasons why the Tilted album, the, the Tilted Axis album was so long was there was a big body of material, but I wanted to put it out on one album, so it's 75 minutes long, since, but, um, but it's almost a, a one-act theater piece in itself from beginning to end, uh, being, being done that way. But, um, but still the pieces are more or less, with a few exceptions, sort of based in 4-4. And the reason of that is because since this began as procession music, when Tilted Axis began five years ago for an event called Make Music Winter um, as a public parade, and I, I like to call them processions because uh, mm. I think it's right in the album note, what is the difference between a parade and a procession? I say intention. And it's amazing how just putting it that way into the minds of the players, everyone all of a sudden shapes up a little bit, stands up a little bit straighter, and, right. and um, yeah, and projects um, a different kind of vibe. But a lot of that music had to be in 4-4, because that is the tradition of uh, being a biped and playing music that is mobile, uh, going back to all kinds of um, marching bands, processions, going back, I'm sure, a lot further than that. Sure. Yeah, because we have, I have found out that while it's possible to play in, you know, 7-4 or 13-4, or when we're moving around, it's, um, it's, it is more challenging. So, um, so this album's not going to be concentrating on that as much as I want to be able to create music that uh, might not be as mobile, but can be used in a fashion. I, I like to say I'm, I'm concentrating on... Um, music for planetariums, because for me that's that's sort of the dream gig. Because most museums, sorry, I have planetariums, so we have had a number of uh, tilted axis events where we were mobile inside of a uh, museum. So there's plenty of room to move. You can be inspired by the art, but I and for me as a producer, I don't have to worry about the weather. <laughs> that was always uh, a huge concern because you know when you when you go through all this effort and it's a one day two day event and if you have the weather go bad on you all else but I never have to worry about this inside you know big um, museums and most big museums do have planetariums and uh, I have written a number of theater works. Uh, and chamber works that are based uh, upon elements from science, whether it's the human genome. And I actually had a piece called Big Bang before the the hugely popular CBS sitcom um, came on the air and pretty much killed <laughs> that title uh, for <laughs> for anybody else. So, um, and that was actually created, in, you know, and like a lot of this work was created in collaboration with scientists because that's very important to me too that. Um, whether one seems that these pieces are whimsical, uh, because um, I'm doing my poetic interpretation of these scientific things, still, as it's presented, um, the science has to be correct and accurate, and um, and that's uh, very important to me. So you know, you can bust me on a whole number of things. Why did you use that chord? Why did you decide to use that rhythm? But you can't bust me on the science. So. <laughs> I do look for and 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 um, I found a lot of inspiration in, in my gamelan works and other pieces, um, uh, structural models that can be found in science. And that um, that was another phase I went through in finding um, stru um, uh, structures and forms in chaos theory. 
and music that is um, self-similar and self-described, where maybe finding one measure of the music in a way becomes the DNA for a larger piece. It's just a matter of um, scaling it, you know, to different discrete levels, moving at different speeds. But that kind of stuff just really interests me, and that's uh, the kind of stuff that gets me motivated. But first and foremost, if you're just, you know, a casual listener or a deep listener, um, it would be nice that there's a level or layer there that, uh, that you could find worthwhile. You've mentioned uh, gamelan music quite a bit, and for people that are unfamiliar, um, I thought it might be helpful for you to define what that is. Part of our mission is to educate people and to expand their horizons, you know, with music. Um, but also, you've mentioned in other interviews, music is such a social um, event, and in this day and age where you know, you've got people like me who sit in a bedroom recording interviews, you know, and guitar things on our own. Um, <laughs> not my bedroom. Well, a bedroom in my house, but yes. <laughs> but it's just interesting to me that um, I grew up just playing an instrument, not thinking of it as such a social thing. But music to you is clearly very social and almost all of your work is for a group and sometimes mostly large groups it sounds um, at least large compared to normal band sizes of you know three to five piece so could you talk about gamelan and and your concept of uh you know music as a social event sure well i mean well first of all i've been talking about uh gamelan gamelan is the Indonesian word for orchestra. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the Indonesian gamelan, you might as well be saying the Indonesian orchestra. And their indigenous ensemble, whether it's Java or Bali, um, is made up of a series of metallophones. Or as I tell people, like xylophones, but except all the keys are made of bronze. So that it has a really nice um, metallic ring and shimmer to it. And these are all arranged from tiny little ones that play in very high octaves of, you know, um, five or s usually five note scales. There are some seven, but that's getting, you know, a little too inside baseball. But they, yeah, but pretty much like in one octave per instrument. So as you go down the octaves, the instruments get progressively bigger and bigger. So you get to the very lowest octaves and you have maybe, you know, huge slabs of bronze that are playing these low notes. And then the foundation that holds that all together are huge um, um, button-faced gongs that, um, not to be confused with uh, the Chinese tam-tam that you see at the beginning of a lot of old movies. Mm -hmm. this is a, these are gongs that are tuned to specific pitches. And a lot of the music centers around, you know, some kind of a tonal center. And um, so they have all these instruments. Sometimes, you know, 30 to 40 players playing these. And they're held together by um, two drummers playing something that I guess would look like um, congas, you know, held across the lap on the side. What makes this ensemble interesting to me is that um, musically is that all the instruments are played in pairs and the reason for that is that if they have like you know two little ones and then two next size two of those is that the players playing in pairs they're able to produce very um, blindingly fast passages by I guess the, the Western word is hocketing where they each um, divide up a melody so if they wanted to play something that was 16th notes, you know, one player might be going like, you know, and the other guy would be playing the opposite of that, you know, when you put the two together. But it becomes a, a great um, thing to listen to, having two ears, because you hear this melody broken up. To complicate matters even more, is that these two guys also have another two guys playing their same parts, 
but they are tuned a couple of cents depending on the village. Some village like, you know, a large number of cents apart, some smaller number of cents. But when you have those two bars that hit at the same time, the same pitch, and they're off a number of cents, there will be a vibrato that happens between the two. Oh. And so instead of just having a, a, a dull ringing tone, they'll actually, you know, produce this shimmer. And a lot of gamelan aficionados feel that, um, um, so, well, some villages feel like, you know, oh, we're more rock and roll than you because we like a wider vibrato. So we tune ours 15 cents apart and, and other people say like, oh, no, that's too brutal, you know. But there's all different kinds of styles and like any other kind of music, um, there's uh, many different um, uses for it. But one of the things that, um, that I found attractive and, and lent my ear to to listen to it was it was one of the um, along with West African drumming, which um, similarly concentrates on patterns that fit together in um, a hocketing kind of fashion. Um, that attracted uh, uh, composer Steve Reich, and he was also attracted to in Indonesian gamelan too, because the, the a lot of the rhythms could only be described as you know um, very bebop sounding when you go to uh, the island of Bali, which is um, interesting in that they've had this long tradition of creating the music in Java, but then in the 1920s, when the, the Dutch, were, and a lot of Dutch artists were um, taking advantage of it being a colony and hanging out there for inspiration, but a lot of the Balinese gamelan music was really a 20th century creation. They actually, in the way that people used to chop old cars and turn them into hot rods, they pretty much melted down the Javanese gamelan and rebuilt it for speed. And at the same time that we were having a pro that some people were having a problem in the Western world, that classical music musical instruments were being bastardized by being used to play jazz in the 1920s and those rhythms were were by were barbaric and it was you know not for lofty purposes the exact same thing was happening in Indonesia in terms of these beautiful chord instruments of the Javanese gamelan had been melted down and now it's being played by those barbaric Balinese hmm. um, as a kind of moron music <laughs> or, or, or as that's what jazz was you know being derided right. as in the 1920s, but um, but to pull that whole thing together and to put an umbrella over it all is that um, this music doesn't exist um, in an abstract fashion in these uh, societies. You know, whether it's the the courts of Java or the the more ceremonial use uh, in Bali, they're always for a specific purpose. Um, and they're and and they're still not like a lot of West African music. They're still not divided from the dance. There's not the dance. There's not the music. It's one and the same thing. That division has not been made yet. So if it was, you know, it was it was the afternoon ceremony to an offering for the gods. There is a specific music and dance for that. If there was a special ceremony for the full moon, which full moon? Well, we got a piece of music for that and a dance for that. And there's more you know, social uh, ceremonies that, that would always have their village gamelan and their dancers dance for, you know, weddings and feasts and all these other things that um, every society has used to mark their calendar. So that's the one thing that interested me very much was that um, the music had a purpose in every society. And when I first went to Bali, I've been there three times uh, to study and to work is that as you would pass the different villages, you could hear each village having its own gamelan perform its evening music or um, taking part in some kind of a ceremony. It's, it's for real, you know, and that's why I liked it. And they have their own tuning system, which I found very interesting too. Um, they're using five-note scales, but they're not exactly at all uh, tuned like, you know, the, the five black keys on our piano. They're, they may be technically pentatonic scales because they use five notes but they break up the octave very differently um, so when you do hear it 
you know, you have to, you listen, all of a sudden, there's no such thing as harmony, per se. It's a lot of it's horizontal movement. So, anyways, this obviously is, was hugely um, um, impactful, you know, upon what I wanted to do. So, when I studied those rhythms and studied how things are put together, I did join Gamelon, Son of Lion, a new music gamelon that had been around since the 70s here in New York City, and it gave a chance for young composers to write for these ensembles, um, for that kind of ensemble and, and experiment. But I was also interested in like using those kinds of rhythms and, and uh, non-standard tunings with my electronic keyboard ensemble, because I felt like I owned that more. I didn't want to be like, you know, grabbing someone's music. But I, I, I was happy to learn about how the rhythms could um, interact and apply that to um, a lot of the other music I've been using. And a lot of that still carries uh, forth uh, when needed um, in uh, everything I do today. And a lot of that can be heard on, um, on this last uh, Tilted Axes album. You know, here and there, it's there. Right. And Steve Reich's uh, Music for 18 Musicians, that's one of my favorite albums of all time. You've mentioned it in a couple of places. Um, yeah, uh, a I would friend imagine. gave that to me when I was 14, and that's maybe uh, too young. <laughs> but uh, I would imagine, you know, these kinds of ensembles that have had such an impact on you have greatly informed your composition style and going to Juilliard did, did you study uh, orchestration or something you know or write pieces for larger ensembles or is that just something that you felt personally inclined to do I always say I went to Juilliard but I never claimed to have finished Juilliard so anybody who says I'm a Juilliard graduate is, is, <laughs> is, is creating a fiction that I never put out <laughs> but, um, but I did go to Juilliard for two years but I never finished because I had to work here and I, I did that by working for classical music publisher C.F. Peters, who also published uh, John Cage's work. So mm -hmm. that's how I was able to um, meet with the people who were working with John Cage and, and work within that circle. But um, I was taking private composition lessons when I was 15 um, because that's all I was, do you know, I was doing. I was just trying, right. even when I didn't know what I was doing, I was still have a facility for writing music and and I thought I was drawing pictures maybe sometimes but but you know, the patterns are there but um, orchestration um, really came about for me not having an orchestra was um, was by having electronic keyboards and synthesizers mm. and um, it seems that the way our ears work and that the way uh, physics work works that you, you can find any possible sound making device and you can um, pigeonhole it into well is it uh, st string like is it percussion is it brass or is it like a woodwind sound because that pretty much covers the um, the spectrum of um, of how sound is made and what we're going to have but working a lot with, with orchestral scores and working a lot with uh, composer composers um, contribute a lot towards just um, understanding orchestration and how it works and one of the things that was useful was um, moving to New York City and just knowing a lot of people really doing it cool. you know it's like well read this book because everybody here read it and that's how we're doing it <laughs> <laughs> you know and so and you know that, that becomes a whole little culture in itself but a lot of that, uh, I did grow up playing violin and viola and playing in orchestra, so I had a good idea of how all these instruments work, and I was writing for these instruments ever since I was a kid, so uh, it didn't, you know, happen overnight, but, um, but that was definitely part of it. But getting back to what you're saying, uh, but I've always liked uh, the idea of uh, music for ceremony, and I was, you know, working with uh, the Living Theater, who was influenced by um, Artaud, Theater as ritual is um, mm. the way they went on that. Um, John Cage himself saying that you know every performance is a you know is an ele um, is a form of theater, and I and I, I take it you know as seriously as that. And um, 
so I've been able to apply that, and, and of course my love of Indonesian Indonesian music. So I, I maybe uh, you know it's not just a gig for me. It is it is a kind of a ceremony. Even the smallest performance, you know, should be taken that way. And I think that whether it's expressed to the public or not, that this is the um, the reason you know uh, behind the performance. It comes through. Um, even David Byrne of the Talking Heads, and he wrote a book called How Music Works. And so it's got some good sections, but the the one section that I think that um, that he writes near the beginning that reinforces what I'm saying is that he's coming out of like playing CBGBs right in the right. in the late '70s. But uh, any music that ever seems to work has to come out of some kind of a scene. You know, if there's no scene, you know, the music you know doesn't go very far. Hmm. So when so maybe his word you know, is, you know, it has to come out of a scene, but I think that's a form of a ceremony. You know, you look at like something like CBGB's in the 70s, that was like a church in a way. Everybody, right. knew, it, it was a ritual. People knew how to dress for it. And people knew how to act for it. There was a whole, you know, um, code that went along with those series of performances, you know. That had its code, as well as performances in Indonesia, as well as, uh, you know, um, at a at a rave in Amsterdam has its code, so yeah. So whether you want to call it the ceremonies or scenes, it's important, and and that's one of the things I like about uh, producing shows is you are creating a scene, um, and and if you're going to do that, it's good to know what all your forebears uh, did before you, not just in terms of their successes, but a lot of times in terms of their failures too, because you don't want to you know. You don't want to fail when you don't have to, but uh, <laughs> but if but you know, but if you don't try, you know, you'll never know. But you can't right. be afraid to fail because I can't say that everything uh, I've done has ever worked. But uh, you can you know, dust yourself off and learn something from that and, uh, and move on. But I'm happy to say it seems like you know there's been enough things uh, that we've done that when we synthesize and pull these together, it's been having. Um, a decent impact on a large number of people. So, despite uh, 2016 being such a year of extremes, there has been good parts. Absolutely. And uh, to wrap things up, can you tell us uh, where to find your music and where to find more information about you and your projects? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll take this as an opportunity to tell you that uh, as a result of my. Um, interest in chaos theory and such, the name of my production company has been um, Strange Music. <laughs> so if you got the weird music, I've had the strange music. <laughs> and people would say, well, well, you know, and I used to you know, put on Strange Music concerts, Strange Music Presents, and when I was with BMI, it was Strange Music um, was the name of my publishing company. Now it's Peppergreen Media that I'm ASCAP, but still but my larger company, the one I, f I file with Uncle Sam every year, that's Strange Music Incorporated. Oh, that's cool. And the reason why is because I was finding a um, number of reasons. First of all, the word strange also contains my name Grant in there. <laughs> and um, But also I was thinking of the strange attractors that were found in uh, chaos theory in terms of um, you know patterns that are created out of you know seemingly random events. But also um, influenced very much by... Um, a Samuel Butler quote that John Cage was particularly influenced by, and that is, um, the only things that we truly hate are the unfamiliar things. Because mm -hmm. those, especially when, when you apply that towards music, you know, a lot of people, you know, they want to be pacified, they don't want to be challenged, you know. Right. And I remember that um, even albums like uh, Steve Reich's uh, 18 Musicians I mean, I was 14 years old, and I can't say I liked it the the first time I heard it. But it's but like most things that I really end up liking, I get challenged, or I don't like it at first. But you keep on coming back. You're like, oh, let me listen to it again to be sure that it really sucks. And <laughs> and as it turns out, it grows on you because it ends up changing your mind. And, right. and it's that um, and it's that laziness that a lot of people are uh, battling with when they're challenged. So, anyways, that's so. That was uh, 
the name of my company. So it's still like all websites, you know, lead to Rome, or at least all websites lead to the same place. So, but if you go to strangemusic.com, that's the same as patrickgrant.com, which is the same as tiltedaxis.com. So that's uh, one way of centralizing things, because I find that uh, after a 30-year career, people stumble upon my work or are looking um, to get up from my work um, different things. So there's different ways of uh, putting it out there. So that's, uh, that's pretty much information central for me. If you go there, you'll see that we have our own podcast called the Strings and Things Podcast and that we have uh, Facebook fan pages and all the usual stuff you'd expect to find. But if you, but I keep it uh, for, it needs a revamping, but, uh, but all the information is current. Excellent. I, and I have to say, speaking of, of such, you really do a fantastic job uh, at Make Weird Music. Um, your stuff looks great. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. It's really I, nice. I noticed there. those things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. There, there is so much more I want to talk to you about. Um, so, if if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to have a follow up conversation with you, uh, in, in in a while, you know. Sure. Plenty to think about from this, and plenty of uh, places to diverge. Oh, absolutely. But uh, <laughs> but thanks for letting me spot off. But I hope uh, I was helpful in uh, anything oh, I did have to say. Uh, being thorough, but not too thorough. Oh, it's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh -huh.